Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Hi, and welcome to The Long View. I'm Jeff Patak, Chief Ratings Officer for Morningstar Research Services. And I'm Amy Arnott, Portfolio Strategist for Morningstar Research Services. Our guest this week is Rick Reeder. This is Rick's second appearance on The Long View. We last interviewed him back in May 2020, and we're happy to welcome him back. Rick is BlackRock's Chief Investment Officer of Global Fixed Income, Head of the Fundamental Fixed Income Business, and Head of the Global Allocation Investment Team. Rick also is a member of the firm's Global Executive Committee, its Investment Subcommittee, and is Chairman of the firm-wide BlackRock Investment Council. In addition to these duties, Rick manages numerous multi-asset and fixed income strategies, including BlackRock Global Allocation Fund and a new active ETF that the firm recently launched called BlackRock Flexible Income ETF. In the spirit of full disclosure, Rick is a portfolio manager to the Morningstar Funds Trust Total Return Bond Fund. Rick, welcome back to The Long View. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, it's our pleasure to have you. Thanks again for doing it. We wanted to start the conversation with the new ETF we mentioned in the intro. It's called BlackRock Flexible Income ETF, and it's your maiden voyage, so to speak, as an ETF manager. Can you talk about the ETF strategy and how it differs from the other mandates you run? Yeah, th- thank you. Yeah, no, we're, we're super excited about it. It is, um, you know, the beauty of of ETFs is there is a distinct investor base that's growing in size. And uh, and I would say they're distinct today, but becoming, I would say, in the normal mainstream going forward. And they're looking for things that can go into models, things that can give them a differentiated return. And, and there's been, obviously, the success rate of passive ETFs has been people are getting what they want to get in terms of index returns. But in fixed income, most managers outperform the index. And the reason why is that there are 68,000 fixed income securities. I mean, it's pretty extraordinary. So the series of tools you have at your disposal is pretty amazing. And so your ability to tactically asset allocate to where there's yield, where the opportunity set has grown in fixed income, you know, and to do it through an ETF wrapper is something that a lot of people are excited about, a lot of people are looking for. And so why we created this. So the idea is get people yield and so today we're yielding at about 7% and then try and manage your asset allocation, keep your volatility lower than a traditional index would be, but then just try and create what is a consistent return. I mean, I, the one thing that I think is super powerful around you know, the next few years is that you're going to see more dispersion. You're going to see more defaults. You've got, you know, we went through this unbelievable period of very low interest rates, quantitative easing globally. And so you didn't have much dispersion. If you look at, for example, the high yield index today, half that index trades at wider than 800 and tighter than 300, and then the other half is in the middle, meaning there's like extraordinary dispersion. And there's some credits that trade too tight. Why own them? And then you know some of the ones that are distressed, like you know really do your credit work to see if you want to own any of those. So dispersion is growing. The opportunity to get yield to tactically allocate to where the opportunity set is going to be. And to try and create a better mechanism to outperform is why you know why you're seeing that sort of excitement around it today. So with that as a, a backdrop, when you're thinking about liquidity, how does the liquidity profile of the ETF compare to that of the other strategies that you manage with other wrappers? And do you have to adapt your portfolio management style to the ETF structure given, you know, the need for more liquid underlying securities? Yeah, it's a great question. So part of, you know, A, in terms of people are looking for these to be as, you know, transparent, they understand how they'll fit in a model, to understand the beta, you know, how will this react under different scenarios? So, you know, how is this different than we would run in a mutual fund? One, we would use less assets that are sort of bespoke private And to create more. So areas like securitized emerging markets, which is a big place to get yield. You know, we want to make sure we're using more of what is mainstream assets within those those areas. So a little bit different from that regard so that, you know, for somebody looking for it to understand the beta and can recreate. You see a lot of players that try and recreate this on a um, whether it's sell side or otherwise. And so this will be, you know, yes, more liquid. And, you know, maybe not take advantage of some of, you know, in a mutual fund, you know, some of the things that can be more highly structured and you can hold for a longer period of time. 
and that give you some yield. But you know, the beauty of this is, gosh, we can still use Securitize. I mean, that market is huge. You know, we could still use EM, uh, same, but maybe use it a little bit differently. You know, we would in this structure. You know, we do a lot of hedging in our mutual funds. You know, we'll use options and. You know, we use, a, you know, whether it's, um, you know, TBAs versus pools, et cetera, we'll do. Whereas here, you know, less hedging and more of the organic asset you would own. And, um, you know, so that people understand what it is and can manage to it. And, you know, we think there is, we think there's a load of people that want to look at, give me that. And then, gosh, I'll go in a mutual fund where I could do more of bespoke. And then, you know, where the manager's doing a lot more hedging of the portfolio and a lot more, um, you know, managing the dispersion and the volatility around it. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing that about the ETF. I did want to jump and talk about the macro picture, the economy. This year's been, in many ways, especially confounding from a macro perspective. The Fed has continued tightening the existing home market has, I, I suppose you could say, it's stalled in various ways. Inflation is still above target. Why isn't the economy? Why isn't I should say the economy doing worse than it seems to be in light of all that? So you know, I think the U.S. economy is one of the most extraordinary economies that in in the history of how people think about business structure and about um, you know how the world works from a commerce point of view. I can you know, I did a presentation where I called the U.S. economy the polyurethane economy, meaning it's so flexible, so adaptive. You know, when you think about like those Tempur-Pedic beds, when one side of the bed has volatility, the other doesn't necessarily have that. And I quite frankly think that is the case here in the U.S. economy. It's 70 percent services, 70 percent consumption. Services don't really go in a recession. And, um, you know, think about how people spend on healthcare, education, et cetera. It doesn't really go in a recession. It's so different than 20 or 30 years ago when you had a commodity oriented economy that was spending an awful lot and, and manufacturing was driving the economy, you could have big cyclical evolution. U.S. economy today is much more stable. And then, you know, you break it down and you think about, you know, it's an economy that now has energy independence, spends a tremendous amount on R&D and tech, and quite frankly, also has brought the debt down, now, which, which seems inconceivable when you say that because when people look at the size of the government debt. But the way economies work is there four parts of your debt structure? It's your private, it's your household, it's your corporate, it's your financial, and then it's the government. And you think about what's happened over the last few years. Households have delevered, financials, particularly big financials, have delevered, and corporates have extended their maturity and have brought down some of their leverage. So it's just the government that holds the debt, meaning the stability of the economy, even when interest rates grow is not that significant. And so I know I think people will continue to question, you know, is the economy going to go into a recession? And you just had this immense amount of growth. I mean, nominal GDP in 2021 was 12.3% and 22 was 7.3%. I mean, if we went into two quarters of negative one, it's like the economy is still operating at an incredible level. So I know I think the economy will continue to confound people for a long time. Yeah. So with that said, what is your opinion? Are we going to get a soft landing? And what kind of indicators are you paying attention to when you're looking at the economy and trying to gauge the trajectory? So, you know, a lot of the traditional indicators, like people talk about the inversion of the yield curve. I actually don't think the inversion, I think the inversion of the yield curve has predicted nine of the last three recessions. I don't think that is a terribly good, particularly when the economy is not that interest rate sensitive anymore. But listen, I think the economy is moderating, and I think you have to assume that a 3.5% unemployment rate is not going to be the go forward. You know, we've gone through this incredible structural lack of labor in the system that in places like healthcare, education, leisure, hospitality, restaurants, hotels, airlines, and you have to believe that 35 is not going to be the steady state going forward. So you know, big focus on employment and to see do you get some softening there. You know, quite frankly, I also think the global economy, it can and is slowing. And you look at China and then the impact that's having in Europe, that the global economy can have a, uh, can certainly have a, a negative influence. So we watch what's happening extra to the U.S., which I think is will give you a pretty good indicator. You know, and then beyond that, we, you know, we're watching, you know, technology, 
really closely. And, you know, if you break down, you know, consumers in good shape, savings are at a good level, slowing a bit in terms of what those savings are, employment should slow a bit. And it's just is a corporate sector willing to continue to spend. And the capex in this cycle is so different because it's largely technology. And so we're watching really closely are the big tech businesses or the or the investments around tech, which now is AI, software, et cetera. And we're we're keeping an eye on that closely to see the companies start pulling back. My sense is that they were going through a step change around companies' investment to make their business more efficient and uh, and increase the level of productivity. So I think corporate spend will continue to be robust. But keeping an eye on those things, I think it's going to be pretty significant from here. Do you think the odds of a recession, albeit lower than they were maybe entering the year, are being properly priced into risk assets? Or do you think markets have gotten a bit blasé? So... You know, I think when you break it down, I mean, I find that some of the credit markets are tighter than I think they should be. You know, when you think about what is credit, you get paid yield, you get paid income, or you don't. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think that when you go through periods like this, people forget you can have an increase in defaults. You can have parts of the credit markets that can come under pressure. I said, do I think spreads are going to widen out a lot? Probably not, because I think the economy is in good shape, and I don't think we're going to see a deep recession. Companies have turned their debt out. But I would say the parts of the high-yield market where spreads are, are pretty tight, if you ask me, given upside, downside, and how, by the way, how you can get yield in other places that are, you know, with the risk-free rate so high, you can get a lot of yield. And particularly with the curve inverted, you can get it in the front of the yield curve. So I think parts of credit are a bit, uh, to your words, blasé. But I think the equity market is, you know, you take the companies that are cyclical or more traditional, and whether it's airlines or autos or home builders, energy, and the multiples on those equities are not very high. And so I think they've built in that this economy may slow, your top line revenue could slow alongside of it. And quite frankly, I think those valuations are okay. And because uh, I do think that part of the market has priced it in. You know, the other one is, um, you know, the interest rate market is, um, you know, moved to a level that is, I think, you know, not ref I do think what's going to happen is you'll see rates start to come down as the economy slows. And I think the Fed will have to cut rates in later part of 2024. And so, you know, that's something we're moving some of our risk, some of our assets to taking just more interest rate risk, given these yield levels today. Yeah, so speaking of interest rates, you know, obviously we've had a huge jump in rates over the past year or so. And, you know, as we're taping this in mid-August, you've got the average 30-year fixed rate mortgage at about 7.5%. Um, is that a concern for you? Are you worried that with higher mortgage rates, is housing affordability going to imperil the economy or, you know, throw things more toward the negative side? So, I mean, I, I think people underestimate how important housing is. I mean, if you go back and you think about deep recessions or crises, even 2008, it was obviously the pressure from subprime and the broader housing dynamic. You go back to the early 90s, the savings and loan crisis. Housing is the bedrock of the U.S. economy, and it is roughly 75 percent of the asset value of people in the country and it, by individuals opposed to total aggregate. So it is hugely important. So keeping an eye on housing is such a big deal. But today, why this situation is so unique is we had this period of extremely low interest rates where people locked in their mortgage. And when you spike rates higher, then the reason why you don't see much volume in terms of the housing market is people are sitting in those mortgages now and don't want to give up those low price, uh, those low rate mortgages. So A, I think they're in pretty good shape in terms of what their current interest rate is on those mortgages. B, there's been a tremendous amount of value built up in the home or equity built up in the home. And so that's in pretty good shape today. And you have two things that are hugely important. One is the consumer, the households have delevered. They're not sitting in the same amount of credit card debt and um, mortgage debt, et cetera, than they used to. And then the unemployment rate at three and a half percent. It's like, you know, if unemployment starts to move significantly higher, then you could start to see some pressure on housing. And this is one of the reasons why I think the Fed needs to be a bit careful about how much they continue to move interest rate higher, because if unemployment started to move higher and then you start to infect housing, 
then um, that would create a tricky dynamic for the economy. And that, to me, is, again, a barometer for you know, where stress in the system could be, where stress could be in the banking system, et cetera. So you know, I think you're dead right to focus on housing, and we spend an awful lot of time. It's just in so much better place than it's been organically in a better place than it's been um, over prior cycles. I wanted to shift and talk a bit about inflation, ask you whether you think the Fed has gotten the upper hand in its battle against rising prices, or do you think maybe we've gotten a little bit complacent and there are still embers, so to speak, that could reignite inflationary pressures? What's your take? So, I mean, I think you have to build into your model that there is, and I think there's roughly a 15 to 20 percent chance that inflation reaccelerates. And, you know, what would cause that? You know, wages, you know, per the point I was making before about there's a structural need for people in this country. And by the way, not just this country, in Europe, UK. So wages are going to stay high. And then the in service sector inflation, you know, can stay higher than it has and potentially reaccelerate. But again, I don't think that's the base case. You know, my base case is inflation is on the way down. I mean, we've certainly achieved on the good side of the ledger. I mean, at least last three month goods inflation, if you take out used cars, which, by the way, are coming down significantly. But if you take that, I mean, you're, you're talking about negative inflation. I think it's negative 0.7 percent over a three month moving average. So goods inflation is coming down. And I think that is persistent that you'll see that, you know, again, we're talking about used cars. And then the other one that's been sticky has been shelter. But shelter, you can do a pretty good job of predicting because you can see the availability of rental that's coming on the market. So my sense is that shelter is coming down as well. So my base case is that inflation is moving lower, more to a normalized two and a half to three percent. And so I think I'm and I'm we're, you know, pretty confident in a moderating economy that that will continue to be the place in case there is some exogenous shock in the world. By the way, you think about why we had this sort of inflation, supply chain shock post-COVID, a war that infected food and energy prices. You know, my sense is if we're in a more normalized world and a moderating economy and the increase of things like AI coming in and productivity enhancement, you know, I think the base case has to be that that we'll be at a lower rate of inflation that we've been at over the, uh, certainly over the last few months. And, and you're seeing that play through today. So when you're thinking about inflation, you know, it's obviously caught a lot of people by surprise, both on the upside and the downside. So what's the simplest way to explain why inflation spiked so high and why it's now coming down? And, you know, do you attribute that to the fiscal stimulus? Do you worry at all that the unprecedented levels of fiscal stimulus will have an inflationary effect over longer periods? I mean, so, you know, if you break it down and say, gosh, we had the combination of fiscal and monetary, immense amounts of fiscal and monetary stimulus coming in all together, booing, you know, huge amount of growth in the money supply, over $2 trillion of savings in the system, this delevering of consumer debt we talked about, pretty incredible. And I, you know, like I say, I think we're on the backside of, of much of that today. And so that gives you some confidence in persistence of lower levels of inflation. There was this monstrous labor, undersupply of labor. You're seeing all the jobs that are being created, literally all the jobs that are being fulfilled today are coming from immigration, from international. And so to the extent that you see more and more of this, then um, you know that should dull some of the wage impact. And then we talked about the post-COVID, I mean, the supply chain shock, the war, and the shock that it's had on food and energy. So you know, my sense is all these things are starting to become more normalized. And so that I think we're, um, I wouldn't say we're in the rearview mirror of higher levels of inflation because you still are getting a deglobalization effect. You're still getting, you know, what will be a significant spend on things like climate, clean energy initiatives, uh, infrastructure initiatives. So my sense is inflation will stay higher than we've been used to in the pre-COVID period. But a lot of those exogenous shocks that nobody in our industry has ever seen anything like before, they was creating things like 12% rates of inflation in goods when people were locked in their homes and all of a sudden had to buy cars all at once or furniture or electronics or what have you. So, you know, my sense is this will be more normal, save some exogenous shock. But boy, you talk about the perfect storm of things happening all at once to create excessive levels of inflation. You know, my senses were, were past some of that. By the way, I want to add that one last thing. 
is people don't, you know, I've seen some studies on AI's impact on the job function and about the efficiency of running your business. And you're seeing this incredible amount of capital investment in that space. I've always felt like you can interpret what inflation will be for the next few months, maybe a year out. But I think we're going to enter a period where it's going to be hard. To, it's hard today to estimate how much of an impact that's going to have. My sense is, though, it's going to be a pretty significant amount. As you reflect on COVID and the policy response to the coronavirus, how would you appraise it? And, and what lessons do you think can be drawn, do's and don'ts, if you will, to the way fiscal and monetary policymakers responded to COVID? We've certainly, we've talked about some of the aftermath and so far as inflation, yeah. but as we look back on it, do they do a good job of responding? So I think you'd have to give an A to an A plus rating for how quickly, particularly the Fed came in and was flexible in their approach and was willing to go at different types of investments and then took out the quote unquote bazooka to make sure people realized they were serious, whether that's dropping rates, doing QE, willing to buy assets that are not normally within the Fed's purview. That was incredible. And then the fifth, the amount of fiscal spend in conjunction with that was also incredible. I think, you know, so then what would I give a lower grade for? I would say, you know, staying in the policy too long. And I think the do's and don'ts will be be aggressive early on, show what you're willing to do, but then back off. You know, you think about how long the Fed stayed in this easy policy, which seemed inconceivable that we needed to stay there for that long and do QE almost at the same point in time that we started raising rates aggressively. My sense is that that going forward won't be repeated, I hope. And listen, the one thing I will say about policy, policy at the extreme, I think can be more debilitating than it can be accretive. And, you know, things like negative interest rates, which I think make no sense. You know, we had negative interest rates for a long period of time. It dulls velocity, hurts the banking system, hurts the pension system, hurts investment. People don't want to make debt investments, so they put all their money in equity investments, which raises cost of capital for companies, despite the fact you brought interest rates down. I think I think policy at the extreme needs to be rethought. And, um, you know, use it aggressively when you have a pandemic, when you have a financial crisis, when you have an exogenous shock, use it aggressively. And then once you stabilize the system, get out of the way and let the system, particularly in places like the U.S., you know, where the system has this extraordinary ability to adapt to what those conditions are. So we've had a period of time when the Fed was relatively open and clear about their view on interest rates and potential future directions. You've expressed the view that you don't think that the Fed will be quite as open and forward-looking as perhaps they were in earlier phases of the tightening campaign. So why is that, and what are the implications for investors? You know, I, I don't think central banks need to prescribe every single move or every single tool in their arsenal and how they will employ it. I actually think there's a tremendous benefit for central banks to say, these are the broad environmental conditions we are reacting to. These are the metrics we're looking at. And then, quite frankly, using some flexibility and adjustment, you know, without telling the world in advance, we're going to do exactly this. I mean, it's interesting watching the Bank of Japan now. You know, they're laying out the so they'll buy securities, they're watching it. And I, I think that's great. You know, I think we've gotten, I think the markets require a vast places like the Fed or the ECB or the Bank of England, like lay everything out to us so we know what to watch for. And I just don't think it needs to be that detailed, particularly in periods of greater stability when you're closer to your goals. And that, you know, be we have an incredibly complex economy. And I think, you know, one of the things, you know, when the Fed, you remember, go back in time and the Fed would lay out how many months or what the period of time before they would move, or they'd lay out specific metrics I just don't think they need to be that prescriptive. And I think you let the economy adapt and adjust and then react accordingly. And, you know, the, where you have an impact on the economy and markets tangentially is, quite frankly, a bit of surprise. And I think that's a tool that the central banks can use more effectively going forward versus prescribing, you know, every single word of what we're looking for. And um, I think it's been a bit overused. And quite frankly, I'm really looking forward to less communication going forward. 
I wanted to turn to the consumer. If I'm not mistaken, I think that wages rose faster than inflation for the first time in a while relatively recently, which is good. But it's also, I suppose, depending on how you look at it, potentially bad or unwelcome. How do you think about that sort of that equilibrium between sort of wages keeping up but not running so hard that they create their own sorts of pressures and unintended consequences? So I have a slightly different take. I mean, I think it's great. And, you know, particularly the fabric of that increase in wages, it's low income wages. It's the low wage jobs that have grown precipitously. And by the way, grown in terms of demand, but also grown in terms of those wage levels. You know, for the first time in decades, we're closing the income gap in this country. We're reducing the unemployment rate in the lower income strata. And, you know, you're seeing this in some of the recent um, wage agreements from big companies, and you're moving money from capital to labor. And for years, capital was experiencing the benefit much more than labor was. I think it's great. I mean, and, and in fact, if you look at, and part of why I think the Fed doesn't need to keep raising rates, and I would argue that in my view, they didn't have to go as far as they did, is if inflation is temporarily elevated in places like energy, shelter, food are elevated, that's what hurts lower income people. And to me, it's counterproductive to reduce jobs because it's low income jobs that get reduced. But it's counterproductive to do that when the people getting hurt from the inflation are the people that are actually need those jobs. So listen, I think having wages higher at this point in time for the lower income wages being higher, I think is quite frankly, a very good thing. Going forward, we have, we still have this demographic challenge as you have aging populations and people that have retired and left the workforce, you have this real need for labor. I think in most economies around the world, you need immigration. It's part of why Japan was so tough for so long. They had very rigid immigration guidelines. Immigration helps. AI is going to have a big influence in terms of uh, in terms of the number of the jobs that are required going forward. But, you know, in the interim, to have higher wages in these lower income jobs and quite frankly, to reprice a lot of these lower income job functions to higher levels, I actually think it's a great thing for the economy. And I think it's really healthy today. And that, you know, I don't think the central banks should try and negatively impact that today. So when you think about consumer spending and household balance sheets. You know, there's been lots of worry and hand-wringing about the levels of credit card debt outstanding, but it seems like, you know, in some ways that's more of a function of income growth. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah. And are you are you worried about credit card debt? Yeah, so interesting. In part, it gets to the last thing we just talked about. The people that are, you know, there's an incredible uh, bifurcation of the economy today. And even with, you know, this um, higher level of lower income jobs, it is still, you know, the bottom um, 10% that is struggling. And you see that, like you say, and you're now starting to see higher credit card balances. You're seeing charge offs that are increasing. And it's that bottom 10% that is, you know, still being pressured. And, you know, one of the things about, you know, part of why I don't think interest rates need to move much higher is you think about when you move interest rates higher, who do you help and who do you hurt? You help the wealthy in that those are the savers. Those are the people that are obviously garner a lot of income from investment. But what you do is you hurt the bottom end and you're seeing that play out today in the bottom 10 percent. And that's exactly where the credit card balances are growing. And you're starting to see some consumer loan pressures. So it's something to keep an eye on. And, you know, it's part of why I really believe in the CSIS set the Fed should cultivate more jobs, higher nominal GDP in the economy, and to lift all boats. And, um, you know, like you say, you're starting to see some pressure at, alongside of higher interest rates. But it's, you know, same thing that when you move interest rates to these higher levels in, in a modern economy, different than years ago, when companies used to borrow at the front end of the yield curve, you know, when it was big CapEx spend that was away from things like technology companies that don't really borrow a lot. Now, when you move interest rates higher, you really hammer places like commercial real estate, small banks, you know, the bottom 10 percent. And it doesn't really affect a lot of the other parts of the economy. And so I think you have to be really thoughtful about using that interest rate tool in a modern economy, because that, that is where you're starting to see the pressure today. I think you previously said that some industry segments remain, in your words, structurally understaffed. What do you mean by that? And 
And to what extent does that put a floor under the job market? Yeah. So if you take the trend, you know, the pre-COVID to to the trend rate today of where we are in, in places like healthcare, education, hotels, restaurants, airlines, we are so far below what would be the trend rate of hiring. And you see this from a load of companies. I think United Airlines said they have 91,000 employees after hire 50,000 in the next three years. So think about these companies, hotels, airlines, you can't operate at full capacity. You can't run, you see this with all the flight cancellations today, that you can't operate at full capacity because you just can't find the labor at a, you know, certainly at a reasonable price, but you just can't find enough labor. That is, I mean, it's so hard to fix that. And, um, you know, with an aging population and, um, you know, without, like I say, without immigration, it's really, really hard to fix that. We had a historic number of people leave the workforce that hit an age level, but also built wealth in their, um, you know, because of the appreciation of financial assets. And quite frankly, you know, if, if, um, you know, wages continue to elevate, you'll bring some of those people back into the workforce. But today... We're so far below the trend line. You know, you see like the last employment report was at 60% of the total jobs, 55 to 60% of the total jobs were in healthcare and education. Those are eight. It's not interest rate sensitive. It's not cyclical. It's just this understaffing that still got some room to go. My sense is you've hired a lot of people in the last two or three years. So, you know, that impact will come off a bit, but it's still there you know, across a whole series of industries and particularly industries that aren't cyclical. So we'd like to shift gears and talk a bit about the bond market and interest rates. You know, we've seen this kind of strange situation where long-term interest rates really haven't moved that much despite the repeated hikes in short-term rates. Why is that? And do you think it's just a matter of time before the long end of the yield curve moves higher? And you get back to more of a a normal yield curve as opposed to the inverted yield curve. I mean, I so I think there is a couple of things. One, we are at this incredible point in time where where life insurance companies, pension funds, have tremendous amounts of money to put in the system, and they tend to buy longer dated assets. And um, you know, while you've hit yield levels that work against your liability stream, you've had a tremendous amount of buying that's taken place. You know, it's interesting in the last few weeks, as you're getting now the Treasury is willing to issue more longer out the curve, Japan changed their yield curve control, um, such a bit more flexibility, letting their 10-year rates move higher, that all of a sudden you're starting to see those long rates move up. I think my sense is the curve is going to steepen over the next year or so economy slows, the Fed can start cutting rates. I think they're going to wait until the middle of next year, but you know, with some some variability around that. And then I think the curve will steepen out again. But you know, when you think about asset allocation, you say, gosh, you got a very inverted curve. I can capture a ton of yield in the front end of the curve. I can get six, seven percent without taking a lot of interest rate risk. If you're not an insurance company or a pension fund, you have to wonder like, why do I own that asset? And I can take, you think about if, when you think about your portfolio, you think about volatility, I can get my volatility in equities that have had incredible returns, or I can take it buying long end interest rates, which have negative return this year. And I think you're seeing this big shift of people that don't have to match a liability that have said, gosh, I'd rather get equity upside for my long duration bucket versus owning the long end when you're not getting a lot of carry. And it's questionable whether it's a great hedge today if rates aren't coming down significantly anytime soon. I think you touched on corporate credit spreads earlier, so I might ask you a sort of slightly different question, but it's related. Corporate debt service does appear to be falling as a share of income despite rising rates. To what extent does that reflect firms paying down costlier sources of financing leaving smaller balances of lower rate debt, or or does it reflect other factors in your opinion? What explains that phenomenon, especially against the backdrop of rising interest rates? I mean, I, I mean, companies were incredibly thoughtful about terming their debt out when rates were incredibly low. And I mean, it was, I mean, you think about if you were running a company that has any level of debt, if you didn't term your debt out, like what were you doing? And companies did it in size. Even companies that didn't really need the debt, but 
put on significant amounts of long dated liabilities and debt on their balance sheet because you can gear your return on equity, you know, to create what is a normal. And a lot of tech companies that were becoming mature businesses and now building mature balance sheets. So a huge amount of that was just term it out, term it out at very low interest rates. And like you say, now, if you're running a company, you think about your margins, interest rate has been well taken care of. And now you have pressures coming in from your input costs, commodities, labor, which we talked about. But interest rates have been, you know, the ability for them to term it out has been incredible. You know, the interesting thing as well today, you know, a lot of companies use the front end of the curve for working capital and commercial paper is at 6%. And uh, we bought a lot of commercial paper cheaper than 6%. You know, thankfully, companies don't have to use a lot of that because they've termed so much of their debt out. And they, by the way, not just investment grade companies, high yield companies. So, you know, the interest rate, A, your term structure, your debt is in better shape, and B, your cost structure is much better. Pretty historic that you saw rates that low for that long and to let companies do an incredible amount of refinancing. So in terms of corporate earnings, it looks like company profit margins are back on the higher side of average after having dipped for a while. So how much of that margin improvement comes from pushing through price increases versus cost cutting, or are there other factors at play? I mean, I think the big one is top line revenue. I mean, companies have had what has been an inelastic uh, pricing function for a long period of time that you can just keep, particularly in some of the services areas, that you can just keep increasing price with almost no pushback from your client base. Pretty pretty incredible. You see this in restaurants. You've seen this certainly recently in airline fares. I mean, it's been an amazing thing. So I think you have to start with the big one being you've been able to increase your price in a pretty extraordinary way. You think about in some areas as well that, you know, there were shortages, you know, think about food and other places where you could just keep raising your price. So anyway, that was the big part of margin was, gosh, we can grow your top line revenue faster than your cost structure. You know, now, you know, but I say, you know, now it's evolving. I quite frankly think that consumer corporate is now becoming much more sensitive to these high prices and, and the economy's moderating. So I think the um, pricing is becoming much more elastic today. But then I think there's also something now that's building into it. You know, people underestimate things like just-in-time inventory, your ability to use software to manage your inventory, um, manage your people infrastructure has been pretty incredible about, you know, I did something where I showed how sophisticated now versus classified ads 20, 30 years ago, how sophisticated the hiring is regionally, by sector, et cetera. So I think a lot of those things have allowed companies to be more effective at managing their cost base, you know, even with rising costs. They've been much more effective around that. And then I'd say the last thing that is, is we move to a more service-oriented economy, you know, versus a goods-oriented economy, you become much less sensitive to spikes in commodity prices. And so your ability to keep your margins more stable is much more readily apparent. You know, when you've got, you go back to the 70s and 80s, when you had a more manufacturing, more commodity-oriented economy, I and mean, boy, if oil prices spiked, the system had a problem, companies had a problem. Today, the impact you know, I would say it's insignificant, but boy, you have a really different dynamic when you have an asset light economy than when you're asset heavy and have to be financed as such. I wanted to talk a little bit about allocation. I believe you mentioned in a recent commentary that you expect stock bond correlations to be less stable as long as inflation remains above target. Maybe can you update us on your views, particularly given the fact that the Fed seems to be having some success in subduing inflation? And is that previous view, is it informing the way you run money, allocate assets at this point or not so much? So the first thing I'll say, with the utmost respect for the Federal Reserve, I actually think the reduction in inflation is less because of interest rates moving higher as it is an organic normalization of pricing that you're seeing playing out. But I think that's a critical factor for thinking through asset allocation today. I think the Fed has come to the realization that, gosh, if we keep raising interest rates, the pressure we put on the banking system, commercial real estate, and it becomes incredibly bifurcated because, you know, we're still, after 500 base points of interest rate increase, we're still at a 3.5% of employment rate. So meaning, I think we're at a very different point in time today that, Interest rates, A, I don't think they're a great hedge in your portfolio, because if inflation does reaccelerate, they will have to go further. But I think your base case is they don't go further. So now, build a lot of income in your portfolio. Gosh, you can use the front end of the yield curve 
you know, take a little bit, maybe go a little bit further than we were willing to uh, a few months ago. And now we can go out to the two year, to the three year, to the five year part of the curve, get a lot of carry in the portfolio, build a lot of income, and then take your upside convexity using the equity market. And then parts of the spread markets, things like securitized assets, parts of EM. And, um, you know, it's a very different phenomenon. You know, we talked about it earlier. Gosh, what am I going to do with my long interest rate exposure? Quite frankly, today, I don't need it. And uh, it's not a hedge. It's not giving me enough income. I want to build a lot of income in the portfolio, use the front end, use things like securitized parts of EM, get some yield in. And then, you know, where I can use the different portfolios, whether we're on fixed income or multi-asset, then use some equity for the upside. And the beautiful thing about equities today is the volatility is really low. So where our interest rate volatility is super high and, you know, we like selling that and then buying equity volatility, which is super cheap today. And so you think about, you know, normally when volatility is high, you can't, you know, your hedge is really difficult. And particularly if you're running equity assets or high beta assets, but when volatility is really low, it allows you to build convexity in the portfolio. Don't have to hedge it using long-term interest rates. And that becomes, you can build a really convex portfolio with upside and with a lot of income in it. That's, that's a, you know, for a fixed income, you know, generally fixed income, we do, we do a decent amount of equities as well. But boy, when you can buy interest rate exposure and don't have to take much yield curve risk, much credit risk, that becomes really, really interesting in your portfolio. Because then I could use my risk buckets for places where I can get some real upside, you know, particularly if I could use, you know, low priced options to manage the downside. So you mentioned bonds not being a great hedge. So how does that viewpoint inform your opinion on the traditional 60-40 portfolio? It sounds like you would be in the camp of not necessarily using that as a template at the moment. Totally. And, you know, trying to venture out into other asset classes. So so by the way, if you look at year-to-date, 60-40 is, you know, what are the independent on what people listen to the 60 40? Your equities have done almost 20% return, depending on where you are in equities. And the ag is not that far away from zero. <laughs> so your 60 40 has done really well. It's only because your 60 has killed it and your 40 has done nothing for you. If you said today going forward, gosh, maybe I still like the equity upside, you know, how you manage it. We talked earlier about doing, you know, tech has carried the day, maybe some of these cyclicals that are that traded low multiples. And then what is my 40? Well, maybe your 40 can be, let's say you took 30 fixed income and then you said 10 was in things that are less liquid today, depending on type of portfolio, things like private credit, things like securitized assets where you're going to finance real estate or other forms of financing at 10%, 11%, 12%. Boy, in a world where income can be really helpful, that becomes really interesting. And then what, so now, if I have 60 in equity and I have 10 in these assets that get you 10 to 12% return, what do I do with my 30? My 30 can be, uh, we talked about short end um, investor grade credit, investor grade credit in places like Europe, swap back to dollars, you can get six to six and a half percent yield for buying two and three year investment grade in Europe. Wow. I mean, I've been doing this a long time. That is pretty sexy. And so you get a lot of income and yield using the front end of the curve, you know, maybe out to the belly. Use some of the spread assets, high quality assets. Agency mortgages today are giving you know, with incredible liquidity and an awful lot of yield today and will benefit from interest rate volatility coming down to buying quality income with your 30% without taking a tremendous amount of interest rate risk. Um, I think is really attractive. You know, as time goes on in the next three months, six months, you know, taking more interest rate exposure, like I said, I don't think you have to go all the way out to the long end, but you know. I think taking, you know, as the economy slows and we get closer to the Fed, maybe cutting rates, then maybe evolve the portfolio. But today, boy, this is a great environment to keep your beta down at fixed income and capture an awful lot of income. And so maybe it's logical with our closing question to ask you about one of the funds that you run, which is BlackRock Global Allocation Fund. You just mentioned the fundamental case for venturing beyond the 60-40 into some of the areas that you mentioned. Are we safe to assume that a number of those ideas are being expressed in BlackRock Global Allocation Fund at the moment? Maybe you can talk briefly about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, that is, I mean, that's the whole gig of what we're trying to do. Keep your income really, you know, at really high levels. I think we're running the highest level of, uh, of income in that portfolio that 
we've ever run. And so the idea of being buy a lot of short-term assets, you know, I keep buying commercial paper at 6%. I still can't believe that. And there were some, I bought a big piece at six and a half the other day, you know, use that, then do some bespoke financing in, uh, in parts of, um, you know, there are parts of commercial real estate that are not office that are actually doing really well, like places like leisure, et cetera, asset-based finance, um, you know, in terms of private credit, and so we're doing more and more of that, you know, keeping our liquidity at a reasonable level. And then we've shifted some of our equities to the places where the multiples are not that high anymore. We still are always in global out. I still think tech and healthcare have to be the ballast of your portfolio. And I think the world, because of the aging demographic and the extraordinary growth of technology spend and productivity, you know, those are going to be a bunch of where we're going to hold the equity from today. But, you know, the ability to build a portfolio that is got up real upside and then, um, you know, but being a lot less volatile in a traditional equity portfolio is really in front of us today. So, so yeah, we're doing a lot of it. And, and you know, the point we talked about earlier, we use a lot of, a lot of optionality in two ways. One, you can buy index volatility super cheaply. And, you know, we were do, we literally, you can buy options on the index at 10, 11 volatility. It's incredibly low. And then writing some call options against your against some of your current holdings, where single name volatility is is reason, particularly in tech, to overwrite some of your portfolio. Again, to buoy your income, but create real convexity in the portfolio. So, anyway, it's a fun time for investing in these portfolios because you have so many more tools. You think about last year, last year you couldn't hedge. All you had to do was just get your risk down, get your interest rate exposure down. Now the world has opened up to you in so many ways, and the Fed's not cutting rates for a while. So your ability to get income and then build convexity, it's a, I don't know, it's a fun time. And, you know, we talked about earlier, dispersion, like there are a ton of companies that trade at low equity multiples now, both in not just US, Europe, uh, Asia, parts of the emerging markets. So anyway, it's a fun time to be investing in portfolios like this. Well, Rick, it's also been a fun conversation. Thanks so much for sharing your time and insights with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I loved it. Thank you for doing it. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. Thanks for joining us on The Long View. If you could, please take a minute to subscribe to and rate the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at S-Youth1, which is S-Y-O-U-T-H and the number one. And at Christine underscore Benz. George Cassidy is our engineer for the podcast and Carrie Gretchik produces the show notes each week. Finally, we'd love to get your feedback. If you have a comment or a guest idea, please email us at thelongview at morningstar.com. Until next time, thanks for joining us. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar, Inc. and its affiliates. While this guest may license or offer products and services of Morningstar and its affiliates, unless otherwise stated, he or she is not affiliated with Morningstar and its affiliates. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. Jeff Patak is an employee of Morningstar Research Services, LLC. Morningstar Research Services is a subsidiary of Morningstar, Inc. and is registered with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analyses, or opinions, or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decisions.